Now I would like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Jane Bayani, who will guide us through today's topic, Rethinking Prostate Cancer Surveillance and Treatment Approaches. Dr. Bayani is an early career principal research scientist and the co-director of OICR's Diagnostic Development Translation Platform, which includes Tissue Portal, OICR Specimen Entry, and Handling Team. She received her PhD from the University of Toronto Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Her current research is on prostate and breast cancer, where she focuses on discovering and validating multi-omic prognostic and predictive biomarkers in the early setting, and in parallel developing and validating the associated companion assays. She holds inventorship on two patents, one in breast and one in prostate, and we which are at different stages commercialization and clinical uptake. So Jane, at this point in time, I am going to turn the floor over to you uh, and you can lead off the session. Perfect. Let me share my screen and thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here to um, share with you um, uh, some of the work that um, we've been doing here at the OICR, um, as well as work done by others outside of OICR uh, in the prostate cancer space. And so let's get started here. Um, so this is just a few um, background slides on prostate cancer in general, um, and to give you the context of where our speakers will be focusing. Um, and you, as you can see, prostate cancer does have a, a fairly good survival at five years, um, but this can be misleading as we know that about 20 to 30% of prostate cancers um, end up progressing. And so there still is a clinical need uh, to identify better treatments uh, for these uh, patients. The um, assessment of risk um, and diagnosis uh, comes as part of a combination of um, familial uh, risk factors and clinical variables. Um, most men are diagnosed with prostate cancer following abnormal PSA or digital rectal exam results and are guided through increasingly more invasive diagnostic procedures, ultimately uh, to a needle or core biopsy, which gives a definitive diagnosis of cancer. The treatment is based on, on the risk of progression or aggressive disease at the time of diagnosis and, can, and can conclude um, active surveillance. Uh, and those are for patients that have low risk uh, uh, cancers, and this would entail uh, repeated PSA, DREs, and, in, and interval biopsies. Um, as you progress to higher uh, grade cancers or higher risk cancers, uh, your treatment strategy could include uh, radiation, surgery, hormone therapy, or, or chemotherapy. So very quickly, how is risk assessed at the time of diagnosis? And what I've shown here are the uh, distributions of low, intermediate, and high-risk cancers that are seen at the time of diagnosis. And very quickly, you see that the intermediate uh, risk category comprises almost 50% of the cancer seen um, at, at, in the clinic. Um, and what I've uh, shown here are the different clinical uh, variables um, related to each of these risk categories and the recommended um, treatment uh, for these cancers. So you'll see that for the low uh, and very low pa uh, risk patients, um, active surveillance is recommended. However, depending on uh, other clinical variables and of course what the patient uh, may consider, uh, things like radiation and, and radical prostatectomies uh, might be seen in these low cancers. Among the high cancers, we see increasing um, aggressiveness in the treatment. So radiation, radical prostatectomy, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, and, and as well as chemotherapy. So the question becomes, particularly at the high um, risk cancers, can we find other therapeutic strategies to support uh, some of these patients uh, where these therapies might ultimately fail them? So what about the intermediate 
cancers, which make up approximately 50% of these cancers. Um, these two are broken out into favorable intermediate and fa uh, unfavorable intermediate. And so it's now the balance of uh, treating these uh, patients properly. We don't want to over-treat them and we certainly don't want to under-treat them. And we can see that the options for these intermediate risk patients do range from having um, active surveillance. So how do we balance this? And you'll hear from our speakers today, could we do better with targeted biopsies, targeting those regions of cancers and suspected high-grade cancers? Similarly, we'll hear today about strat uh, strategies to improve risk classification uh, at the time of biopsy. And ultimately, what we want to be able to do is, higher, uh, is to trigger higher risk protocols much sooner uh, in the clinical management uh, of these patients. So I just wanted to quickly show sort of the molec what we know about the molecular events in prostate cancer. And this comes from a review from our colleagues across uh, at uh, the UHN. Uh, and generally just showing that we, we do understand uh, the molecular events that are occurring during uh, malignancy and progression into metastatic disease, but we still need biomarkers to best stratify those patients that have uh, pattern three plus four or four plus uh, three uh, Gleason score, and I've, and I've shown some of the uh, representative histological um, um, patterns uh, for those cancers. So in summary, what we'll hear today from our speakers are, are the challenges uh, in these intermediate, uh, prostate can intermediate risk prostate cancers. How can we improve risk stratification at the time of uh, biopsy? And this would help uh, make the clinical decision on reducing the need for radical prostatectomies, uh, triggering more aggressive treatment strategies earlier uh, at the time of biopsy or at the um, interval biopsies. How can we improve targeting uh, those biopsies um, during that initial uh, 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 diagnosis? Uh, and in that way, we could reduce the number of biopsy cores taken and more accurately sample regions of uh, suspected uh, uh, high-grade cancer. And finally, novel therapeutic options. Can novel therapies impacting hormonal pathways be leveraged without androgen deprivation therapies? And we'd like to open up the discussion as to whether these therapies can be put, provided potentially in the earlier cancer setting. So for those patients who, uh, through biomarker stratification, uh, might be identified as high risk uh, for progression. So with that, I will hand it over to our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Dr. Anna Lee. She received her PhD in computer sciences at McGill University, specializing in bioinformatics of Toronto before joining the lab of uh, Paul Boutros here uh, at the OICR. And Dr. Boutros has moved on since then, Anna is currently working with my team here as um, in uh, diagnostic development where she continues to work on prognostic tests for early prostate cancer. Okay, Thank Anna. you, Jane. And thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to describe our work. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So I'll be describing PRONTO, which is a program uh, involving the personalized risk stratification for early prostate cancer. And next point. So as to reiterate what Jane mentioned, while on active surveillance, 30 to 35% of the men who are diagnosed with grade group one prostate cancer actually have occult Gleason pattern four, which indicates higher risk cancer. And so next point and the next point as well. So this leads to uh, the goal of our program, which is to improve the risk stratification at diagnosis to avoid the negative effects of both over and especially under treatment. Our hypothesis would be that a multimodal biomarker, which is one that uses mRNA abundance, DNA methylation, and or copy number alteration features, has superior performance over biomarkers that use only one a single type of data, such as those on the market right now in identifying grade group one versus grade group greater than equal to two cancers. And the, the idea is that this biomarker would be applied to 
um, diagnostic biopsy tissue. Next slide, please. So moving on to our methodology. Next slide again. We are our, uh, our development involves training with 333 cases, again, in the active surveillance space. Next slide, please. And so our cases were diagnosed with uh, grade group one or grade group two based on their biopsies. And um, they all underwent prostatectomy. So most of our tumors, we aim to have two samples where even though the overall grade of a sample might be a certain level, you can still extract a locally low grade region or a locally high grade region due to the heterogeneity in the prostate tumor. And then we use the prostatectomy grade group to define our two classes, the negative being grade group one and the positive class being grade group greater than or equal to two. Next slide, please. And then in considering what features we would use to help uh, guide our great variables such as age and PSA level, cancer or prostate risk assessment or CAPRA risk group, which integrates various clinical features. And in terms of molecular features, as I mentioned, in general, genes or loci with prior associations with tumor grade group, most of ours are like mRNA abundance features, but we also have 14 DNA copy number um, loci as well as 14 DNA methylation features. So we developed a machine learning pipeline to guide the development of grade group classifiers that would take a patient or sample profile and uh, use that to predict um, the overall grade group of the patient's cancer. So the first step of the pipeline would be to select the data types to use we could use one or more of the ones that I mentioned previously. And the next step, we would select those types of samples to use, either only the low grade samples from each patient or only the high grade or a random sample uh, selected for each patient. Then we would partition the data, training data particularly, for cross-validation. Some subset would be used for training, the other for testing. And then the, an optional step where we would uh, first test each feature individually for significant associations with the great group class. And uh, this picture shows an example of where mRNA abundance, if the values for great group one class are significantly less than the values for the great group greater than equal to two class, that feature would be selected uh, for the uh, subsequent part of the pipeline. So next part, please. And then finally, we would train uh, with our training samples with one of 12 machine learning algorithms. And the resulting classifier would be applied to this testing samples. And the results would be used to estimate uh, the performance. Next point, please. So this pipeline was run repeatedly where each run tried a different uh, training strategy since there are different options within this pipeline. So ultimately, we have results for about 12,000 training strategies and reduce those to only those that have true negative rates of at least 0.5 and true positive rates of at least 0.8. We had a more stringent criteria for the true positive rates because based on our discussions with clinicians, it is more valuable to identify a truly high grade case at the expense of potential false positives by their area under the receiver operator curve. And um, here we're showing those top 10 strategies where each row represents a different strategy. We decided to follow up on the one with the greatest AUC, uh, which uses all types of data, and also the strategy that resulted in the greatest true positive rate, which only used copy number alteration and mRNA abundance features. Next slide, please. So both of those strategies involve multiple types of data, so that we call them multimodal. And from our pipeline results, we compared them to the uh, strategies that only use a single type of data. And if you focus on the mean section of this plot, you can see that the multimodal uh, strategies outperformed the unimodal strategies based on the area under the rock curve. So we then applied uh, these 
training strategies to all our available training cases to generate the Pronto E and Pronto M classifiers. And so we moved on to validate them using a cohort of 202 cases. Next slide, please. And again, uh, we were working with prostatectomy samples, wherein we tried to obtain for most cases, a relatively low grade and high grade example. And to exploit this, next point please. And again, next point. We tried to mimic the biopsy sampling process by randomly selecting one of our, one sample per validation case. And then uh, we, in doing so, we estimated the performance of our classifiers and repeated this process and found that from this sampling process, uh, the false positive rates were less than 0.45, true positive rates greater than 0.7 for greater than 99% of the repetitions. And they also recapitulated the, um, the validation rates based on a non-sampling based approach, which are the white dots here. Next, please. And here I'm showing the prediction scores resulting from the classifiers. The orange ones are for Pronto E, the gray and black for Pronto M. And as expected, the scores for the gray group greater than or equal to two um, samples, so each point is a sample, are greater than the, sam uh, the scores for gray group one scores. But importantly, this is still the case when we restrict our focus to the relatively low grade samples for each case. So in other words, even when you have a, a locally low, it can detect that the overall grade group is actually higher. So in order to assess the clinical impact of these classifiers, we performed a decision curve analysis and found that while, um, so the Pronto E and Pronto M classifiers have greater net benefit than the CAPRA based model, which is a uh, remember the clinical only model. And this is true for threshold probabilities greater than 10%. What that means is, um, so threshold probability is a measure of preference. So if uh, preference for biopsy versus um, like a less, a less preference for performing biopsy. So if we have 10%, that means um, after performing, if a physician were to perform 10 biopsies, so for 10 separate patients, only one of them would test positive. And whereas a 20% threshold probability, um, that would mean like one, of, one out of five biopsies would result in a, a positive test result. Okay, moving on. And then, so importantly, the Pronto classifiers also identified three times more like correctly identified three times more upgrading validation patients than CAPRA. And that means uh, patients that were grade group one at biopsy, but they were upgraded um, based on their prostatectomy results. So next uh, points, again, next point. If we consider a hypothetical cohort of 1,000 patients on active surveillance, this is how the classifiers would perform. The um, true positives in true positives indicate patients that would um, have an earlier biopsy and then likely be followed up with uh, treatment recommendations. For false positives, they would also have an early biopsy, but then not be recommended for further treatment. In true negatives, uh, for the true negatives, patients would be on um, normal active surveillance. And false negatives, uh, the patients would also be on regular active surveillance, but then be, um, they would later receive treatment based on uh, the, base, the biopsy would likely trigger treatment recommendations. Okay, next few points. Again, next, again, next, again, next. Okay, okay. So to summarize, we developed two great group classifiers that incorporate both RNA and DNA features. In cross-validation, these multimodal classifiers outperformed the unimodal classifiers, and they were validated in an independent cohort, showing that uh, as, ex as by design, the, they are better at show resistance to sampling error. And in addition to that, they upgraded more, correctly upgraded more patients than a well-validated pre-surgical risk cap calculator, CAPRA. Next, please. 
currently we're working on a translation phase where we're making sure that these classifiers will work with biopsy samples. And part of that involves moving to uh, targeted sequencing assays. And this it will be followed by clinical validation with uh, at least 400 active surveillance cases where the, um, the classifiers will be applied to the biopsy samples again. And uh, this data is currently being generated. And then Pronto is also um, incorporated in some future projects. So next, please. For example, uh, I guess we're considering this the space where we would like to manage patients with less invasive approaches. So there are uh, plans to develop an MRI classifier to identify occult high-grade cancers and using the Pronto classifiers to molecularly identify these occult high-grade cancers. And the plan would be to valid validate the MRI classifiers in the precise trial data, which has uh, matched MRI and tissue biopsies for patients. Next, please. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge these people, in particular highlighting um, Paul Buchos and Robert Lerserf, who helped develop the machine learning pipeline for this project. Of course, I'd like to thank the patients involved in this study, and the funding is highlighted below. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. And now I will call upon uh, Dr. Masoom Haider to pull up his uh, slides and I will introduce Dr. Haider. He's a clinician scientist in the Joint Department of Medical Imaging at Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center and Mount Sinai Hospital at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on multi-parametric MRI and prostate cancer and machine learning based imaging biomarker discovery. He's the director of the Radiomics and Machine Learning Lab at the Lunenfeld uh, Research Institute and has been a member of the ACR PIRAD Steering Committee uh, for setting imaging standards in prostate MRI. Thank you very much and welcome to AO Mondays. Thanks, Jean. Uh, no disclosures for me. Um, just to um, set a bit of clinical context and a little more detail, uh, Active surveillance is really meant to address um, the issue of old cancer, regardless of aggressiveness. Um, and, you know, the, we've known this for now uh, quite a long time. This is an older study from 2014 with now even longer follow up showing that the, the older approach of elevated PSA to whole gland treatment. Um, is really unwarranted in um, a, a very high fraction of patients uh, that have some risk uh, of prostate cancer. So the concept of active surveillance to be specific is to actively monitor the disease with the idea that we have the tools to catch it early as it converts to aggressive disease in a way that will not affect mortality. And I think perhaps even more important in this context, not affect morbidity and quality of life. Um, so we, we, we sort of have to have faith that we can catch this in time if it does convert from low-grade, non-aggressive, non-life-threatening disease to uh, something in the opposite category. It has now reached a point where there's enough evidence um, that this is part of current guidelines in almost all jurisdictions in the world and it's an accepted form of treatment for low-risk prostate cancer. And the evidence around MR in this specific context is, uh, I would say, not as strong in some other contexts, but it's strong enough that as early as 2014 and 2015 uh, in the UK and in Ontario, and now NCCN, all consider this um, uh, an appropriate test that is multi-parametric MR in the context of, um, of active surveillance, although it's not mandatory um, in those guidelines. There have been standards established uh, with the idea that, um, but these standards are not active surveillance specific. So, you know, how do you report an MRI? We have PIRAD scores and so on. These scores, um, uh, the 
particularly the PIRAD score, similar to the BIRAD scores, related to the likelihood of clinically significant cancer. And in general, there have been multiple studies doing, done showing that the PIRAD score itself, which is an interpretive score by a radiologist, is related to Gleason gray group uh, and in that sense, cancer aggressiveness. Um, in active surveillance, though, we need additional standards. And these standards are related to the changes that occur over time on MR. And there is a tool called the Precise um, uh, uh, Scoring Scheme, which uh, was put together as early as 2016, 2015, which uh, allows um, radiologists to score and quantify change in the prostate uh, over time on MR, but this has not been a larger consensus recommendations, which are suggesting that this should be adopted. So here, let's look at a case. These are diffusion weighted uh, images, high B value images in a patient in his 70s with a positive family history. His brother had prostate cancer at an early age, uh, aggressive prostate cancer. And we can see here at baseline that the prostate looks pretty normal here. Uh, PSA is only 2.3, um, uh, but he did have a systematic biopsy based on that family history and some anxiety with Gleason 6 disease, but very low volume. Uh, a year and a half later, PSA is really the same, uh, but uh, it was up and the patient had quite a bit of anxiety about this. And you know, patient PSA related anxiety is a real issue in active surveillance. And again, at 18 months, we see this little dot here. Um, these dots around the ejaculatory ducts can be related to prostatitis. So we weren't quite sure. The PSA was still quite low for a 70 year old. Uh, and then he came back uh, six months later because his PSA had almost doubled and uh, over this short period. And sure enough, this thing looks a little bit bigger now. And so at that point, this triggered a repeat biopsy, and the biopsy came back Gleason 4 plus 4, 12% of the core. He went on to have a radical prostatectomy, uh, had organ-confined disease, but as many of you know, uh, the Gleason score, Gleason grade group, is really based on the whole prostate assessment, not just a biopsy. And this was downgraded to Gleason 3 plus 4, so uh, that's two grade groups lower, uh, but still clinically significant. So the patient was very happy with this outcome. You could argue that we caught this cancer before its trajectory into potentially aggressive disease. Uh, and the patient, you know, uh, more than 10 years later is doing quite well. Um, so what is the study? And this, th there have been a trial sponsored by the OICR uh, and Prostate Cancer Canada. Uh, and the ASSIST trial uh, was certainly one of the major trials sponsored by the OICR. And in this trial, there were two arms, uh, systematic and targeted biopsy in one arm, where, where the patients had MR and any targets received additional biopsies. And uh, the second group, uh, the control group, uh, just had regular systematic biopsy. All patients had elevated PSA. And the primary endpoint was the pa proportion of patients upgraded. And most notably, despite um, you know, uh, three Ontario centers participating, all of them being academic centers, we saw no difference in the upgrading rate between the targeted and systematic biopsy groups. Uh, the negative predictive value of MR was not. And so this, this was a little disappointing uh, in that one would have expected if we added targeted biopsies that we would see a significant number of additional um, uh, uh, clinically significant cancers detected. But one of the things, the major results in this study and what was surprising uh, uh, is that uh, despite all the MRs being read by one radiologist, central radiologist, there were major differences in the performance of the targeted biopsies between sites. Uh, and in particular, uh, there was almost a three to one difference in target biopsy yield between uh, the primary center and the other centers. And uh, this is a real issue. And I wanna emphasize here that the sampling issue doesn't go away with MR. Uh, you need experienced people uh, who are used to the techno targeting technologies and are really good at hitting these targets. Um, and there's a secondary issue which I'll get into in a minute, which is tumor heterogeneity, that 
even though you might be in an MR target, doesn't mean you're in the most aggressive part of the cancer. So it's a complex issue, but we really are evaluating the combination of MR plus a targeted biopsy and the performance and quality assurance in those is vital to the success. Um, so a positive predictive value of 33% versus 10% uh, is a big enough difference that um, the follow-up in this trial becomes very important to assess, well, what happened to patients two years later uh, in terms of uh, staying on active surveillance or not? And this is where the results get very interesting and somewhat positive for the use of MR. So um, we looked at the 127 patients in the uh, MR arm and 132 in the non-MR arm. And what we see is that the active surveillance failure rate is substantially lower in the MR arm. So patients are, who, you know, who had uh, a, a negative biopsy and negative MR, um, which would be the ones being followed here, uh, had no intervention. Uh, only 20% of those patients fell off of active surveillance for one reason or another, while in the non-MR arm, more than a third of the patients fell off. So MR is definitely contributing to appropriate delay of intervention, um, uh, even in this cohort where we're seeing this variability. Uh, and if we look at two-year biopsy results in these patients, uh, again, uh, only 10% clinically significant cancer in the MR arm versus 23% in the non-MR arm, suggesting, again, that more patients are appropriately being pulled off of uh, active surveillance in the MR arm. Uh, variability where across the three centers, MR, the MR arm only failure rates in active surveillance uh, were as high as 27% uh, in the MR arm in one center and only 4% uh, in the center with the largest accrual. So big variations here in the success of MR depending on the center in Ontario. Um, uh, so this might have been an early adoption issue, um, but here we have the precise trial, again, sponsored by the OICR, CCS, and Prostate Cancer Canada. Uh, and in this, uh, the population is patients who are not on active surveillance, but have never had an MR before. And this was uh, uh, mimicked one of the large randomized European uh, British trials and confirmed those results that clinically significant cancer um, uh, was found in the same proportion of men in both arms while avoiding one third of unnecessary biopsies. And if there's one theme I wanna put across for the use of MR in prostate, early prostate cancer, it's that it results in biopsy avoidance. And this is a sort of anxiety quality of life uh, issue for men um, in that uh, a non-invasive test uh, certainly preferred to 12 needles in the prostate. Um, so um, the two-year follow-up uh, and longer follow-up has also been funded by the OICR and Lori Klotz and the rest of us are excited to publish those results uh, shortly. Um, but again, the issue here is if you look at the site analysis, this is the Canadian national trial. Uh, and again, we see that um, if, if we look at um, the uh, in the MR arm, which is the top two rows, the Gleason grade group two or higher cancer rates uh, are pretty good in all the green ones. But in two of them, if we look at the control arm, the no MR arm, we're having either we're having more cancers detected if you don't have an MR at one center, which is really strange. Uh, and in the other center, it's uh, it's the same. So there's something wrong with the application of MR technology. While there's big differences, I mean, if we look at the second column here, 44% uh, of patients had a great group two or higher cancer um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the MR arm, while only 16% in the non-MR arm. So almost a two to one ratio, target yield ratio uh, for patients uh, uh, in, uh, in some of the green centers. Uh, in, in terms of favoring MR for finding occult cancers. While in two centers in the country, uh, MR actually did worse than a, a systematic biopsy. So very strange. This is the promise 
MR and basically shows here that MR is missing, uh, you know, uh, about 25% of cancers um, uh, that are clinically significant. In other words, grade group two. So we need help. Uh, MR is not perfect. And when you start to look at the histology, uh, and this is, this is some of our work from quite a while ago, uh, um, yeah, looking at what is MR visible and invisible at histology. What you see is that the relationship between MR and tumor is certainly not one-to-one. -one. There are areas of the tumor that are MR invisible. And in particular, many of the smaller tumors uh, are not visible at all. And prostate cancer, as we know, is a multifocal disease. And um, if we look at the more recent results on genomic heterogeneity and multifocal prostate cancer, we see that um, uh, there's no point mutations in common in three quarters of these multifocal sites of disease. So there is a lot of genomic heterogeneity in prostate cancer uh, 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 in the different foci within the gland. So how are we going to address risk profiling a patient with biopsy when we have multifocality, uh, MR not detecting all cancers, uh, and genetic heterogeneity? Um, well, certainly one way is to mine the MR images for more quantitative information and try and get more out of it than a qualitative score. And there are correlations between things like diffusion coefficients and Gleason grade group. Their correlations are loose but they're definitely there. Um, uh, so there is certainly potential value in mining the imaging data further with machine learning techniques and using this to be smarter about how we guide biopsy into the gland based on these radiomic or quantitative features. Um, and certainly that's uh, uh, you know, a big part of the research that we're doing with Jane and others. Um, um, the other thing I would say is that there's a, a real potential and needed role for better fluidics, uh, serum, urine, and semen being the, the uh, uh, most studied uh, candidate um, uh, fluids in this disease um, because of the multifocality. So in summary, uh, patients really want to avoid unnecessary biopsy and treatment, even uh, with uh, uh, grade group one and two disease. Um, uh, so even if you tell them they have great group two disease, there's a, a, definitely a group of patients that, that want to avoid biopsy. MR is part of the standard of care and does help avoid biopsy and reduce active surveillance failure rates. Um, active surveillance without MR even does still fail with metastatic disease and still have unnecessary treatments. Um, and so we need a better understanding of the relationship between imaging and tissue genomics and fluidics to get more prediction accuracy without having to repeatedly biopsy patients. Um, and then a fundamental problem remains this multifocality and genetic heterogeneity in the disease. And maybe system, systemic therapies applied uh, later in the disease can have a role early in disease. And I'm very excited to, uh, interested to hear about the next talk on that uh, subject. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll hand it back to Jane. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Marianne Sadar. If you could get your slides up and ready. Um, so Dr. Sadar is a professor of um, pathobiology uh, and laboratory medicine at the University of British Columbia and distinguished scientist at the Department of Genome Sciences at the BC, at BC Cancer Institute. Dr. Sadar's research has focused on identifying mechanisms of transactivating and androgen, uh, mechanisms of transactivating the androgen receptor, uh, which is a therapeutic target for prostate cancer, as well as other diseases. Uniquely, her research has focused on developing uh, therapies to the intrinsically disordered N-terminal domain of the androgen receptor, uh, which acts as a hub for essential protein-protein interactions required for its transcriptional activity. She has identified the first small molecule inhibitors that directly bind to the N-terminal domain of the androgen receptor uh, that has yielded compounds uh, that have been taken into clinical trials. 
Her current areas of research interests are concentrated predominantly on indications for prostate cancer. Uh, she is a co-founder and past director and officer of ESSA Pharma Incorporated. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Sagar to AO Mondays. So this is this is a new, a new area of research. I, I have disclosure that I am a founder of ESSA and the compounds uh, that I'm talking about have been have been licensed to ESSA and I have stock equity. And these these compounds are in clinical trials right now. So this is just an overview. So I'm gonna talk about androgens, androgen receptor and gene expression. Next, please. Androgen deprivation therapy and androgen receptor inhibitors. Next. The n domain inhibitors, which is the area of research in my lab. Efficacy of AR inhibitors in the presence of androgen. Next. How the n domain inhibitors are unique in that they maintain efficacy uh, in the presence of androgens. Next and some conclusions about can we use these n domain inhibitors for non-castration castrated patients and some future studies. Next, please. Oh, so the compounds, I just want to go over those a little bit so that you can follow the talk. Enzalutamide, of course, is an antiandrogen. Next, it competes with androgens for the ligand binding domain. And this is important because this was one of the reasons why it was thought that antiandrogens don't work well in non-castrated patients, uh, because antiandrogens tend to have an affinity that's anywhere from 100 times less than dihydrotestosterone. Next. The epi compounds, they'll be epi or backup. These are, these are analogs of the first drug that went in the clinic. They're inhibitors that bind to the N-terminal domain of receptor, which is the other end. So antiandrogens bind one end and the N-terminal domain inhibitors are binding the other end of androgen receptor. Next, we have syntokamides, which are LPY analogs. And these bind also to the N-terminal domain, but in a discrete region that's different from the epi compounds. Next. And when I refer to androgen, I will probably refer to the synthetic androgen R1881, which is used in tissue culture because um, it's not as metabolically labile as dihydrotestosterone. Next. So just looking at the androgen receptor pathway, dihydrotestosterone or DHT binds to androgen receptor. The receptor sheds heat shock proteins, goes into the nucleus, interacts on the DNA, of many genes um, interacting with many proteins. And next, please. This turns on thousands of genes. Uh, next. It turns on thousands, actually thousands of genes in the prostate. And it's important because most of us just think of, of genes that are turned on by androgen, but in fact, about half of them are turned off as well. And these genes are involved in the growth and survival and differentiation of the prostate and of course, prostate cancer. Next. So this is just an in vitro experiment using LINCAP cells that are human prostate cancer cells. They have a full length androgen receptor and this is RNA-seq data and the transcripts, um, these are the that have been either treated with vehicle or treated with synthetic androgen. And anything in blue is sort of turned off. The genes are turned off, so the low transcript levels. And you can see here on the right um, bottom with R1881, the genes that are turned off by androgen in blue as opposed to turned on. So next, please. The volcano plot for this data is shown here. In red are the genes turned on. So PSA, of course, the well-known one, KLK2, FKBP5. And as I said, it's about half. So 821 had um, at least twofold induction. But then there's also those inhibited by androgen. And, and these are well known as well, NOV, DAB1, LRR1. And that's about half of the genes. So next slide, please. So just looking at qPCR to validate this, again, these are the well known androgen induced genes. So looking at KLK2, PSA, KLK3 and FKBP5, when you add R1881, you hugely increase the transcript levels. Next, please. And then there's the androgen repressed genes, which are 
We really don't understand the mechanisms and they probably involve many mechanisms of how androgen receptor turns off genes. Um, but here we have DAB1, LRR, and 1, and NOL being turned off by androgens. Next, please. So, of course, the objective of androgen deprivation therapy is to prevent androgen from activating the androgen receptor, which then would block the regulation of these genes. Next, please. So you can do this, orchiectomy, next. LHRH analogs, next. Abiraterone acetate or antiandrogens. So there's multiple, multiple ways that you can target androgen receptor. Next, please. So if we look at the impact of androgen deprivation therapy, we know that androgens have enormous impact on the maleness of, of people, um, the muscle mass, reproduction. But next, please. With prostate cancer, next, if you, if you have androgen deprivation, next, please. There's a whole number of other effects that happen. So it's great at blocking the proliferation of prostate cancer for androgen receptor positive tumors, but there are also some adverse effects as well. So some of these sort of negative impact of androgen deprivation therapy can be directly related to androgen receptor, but some is also due to the impact of not having testosterone, which is converted to estrogen. And so things like osteoporosis, bone health, of course, is regulated by estrogens. When there's no testosterone, that reduces the estrogen that, that is. So the idea that we had is, can we target androgen receptor effectively without castration? Next, please. So this now we're looking at the androgen receptor. It has an N-terminal domain, a DNA binding domain, and a ligand binding domain. Dihydrotestosterone binds to the ligand binding domain. Next, please. And androgen deprivation, of course, targets the ligand binding domain, although indirectly by preventing uh, dihydrotestosterone from being made. Next, please. We can also have the antiandrogens that competitively bind to the same binding site and displace any androgens. And it also causes a, um, a bulky conformation such that, that other proteins can't interact, but it's a competitive binding. Next, please. The epi compounds, these N-terminal domain inhibitors bind to the N-terminus. Uh, epi in particular bind tau-5 region, which has some unique molecular biology that I won't go into. Uh, next, please. And then the syntokamides actually bind a little bit more N-terminal, we think, in the tau-1 region. Next, please. So if we're looking at the epi compounds, they have been in clinical trials. The first drugs were 506, which um, were discontinued because the compound was really metabolically um, labile. It, uh, we had to go up to three grams in patients, excessive pill burden, and it was just um, going out as fast as it went in, so to say. We redesigned the compound to be stable, and this is the FE7386. Uh, it's in three clinical trials. Next, please. And currently it's in phase one. It's slated to enter phase two trials later this year. Next, please. And next again, please. So actually, if you hit next quite a few times, we'll just get these all up here. This is good. Okay. So if we look at in vitro studies, just so I can make the point that the N-terminal domain inhibitors do not bind to the ligand binding domain. On the left part of the slide here, at the top, there's a little diagram of the assay. This is a fluorescence polarization assay, which shows the data below it. And what this assay is, you have the androgen receptor ligand binding domain. It doesn't have the N-terminal domain. It binds to a fluorescent labeled hormone. And then when you add your ligand binding domain compound, such as R1881 or enzalutamide, it will displace the, the fluoromone. And what happens is you see a loss in polarization. So if you just look at the black um, for R1881, what you see is as you increase the concentration going along the x-axis, you see, um, and it hits it around I think that's probably around uh, 30, 
nanogram, nanomolar. And enzalutamide, you know, has very good affinity, but not as good as, as uh, an androgen. It also has in the micromolar um, IC50, but the N-terminal domain inhibitors, which are the flat lines going across the top in, in red and blue, they don't impact, uh, they don't impact polarization because they don't compete for the ligand binding pocket. And so on the right side, this is actually looking in the presence of increasing amounts of androgen. So across the x-axis on the bottom, you see increasing amounts of R1881. This is induction of an androgen activated reporter. So you get more luciferase when you, when you add androgens, androgen receptor binds to the androgen response elements, ARES, and turns on luciferase. So DMSO is just showing increased levels of androgens. The induction of luciferase jumps up very fast and then plateaus. It's the black line. When you increase androgens and you keep enzalutamide, this is in the blue, at a constant. So enzalutamide is being kept at 10 micromolar. And you can see that its inhibitory effect is competed away. It starts to have no uh, in inhibition of the androgen receptor. And then the N-terminal domain inhibitors in the dotted red and, and solid red, it just plateaus. So androgens are really having no effect on how well it inhibits androgen receptor. And the compounds in the middle are just showing you what they look like. The, the iodo epi compound was an imaging agent that we were, we were playing around with. In this particular case, it's not um, radio labeled, it's just cold compound. But the only difference between the two compounds, the 002 and the iodo, is that iodine on the phenyl ring. Next slide, please. So now I'm going into the, the, the actual real data that, that I'm hope, hoping inspires some discussion. So this is sort of the control experiment. So this is under androgen deprivation therapy conditions. So we take our LINCAP prostate cancer cells. They have full length androgen receptor. They're androgen sensitive. They do not make the splice variant. That's the truncated part of the androgen receptor. So which is a different mechanism of resistance. And so we inject these cells subcutaneously into our mice. Next, please. We grow the tumors in these mice until they reach about 100 millimeters cubed and the mice are then castrated. Next, please. Seven days after castration, we randomize the mice and we start oral daily dosing with either the, the vehicle or just castrated, enzalutamide and the castrated, the epi compound BU170, Next. And then we measure the tumor volume over the time course of the experiment. And we harvest the tumors at the end of the experiment and look at differences in gene expression. Next, please. So this is this is the really the experimental part of this. So now we're looking with no androgen deprivation therapy. Same thing, same cells injected subcutaneously. Next. But this is where the difference comes. Uh, when the tumors hit 50 millimeters cubed, we implant a time-release testosterone pellet. This is a 60-day 7.5 milligram pellet. And we do this because mice, unlike humans, do not have sex hormone binding globulin. So their free testosterone fluctuates wildly. And so we wanted to keep the testosterone levels stable. Next, please. So we grow the tumors to 100 millimeters cube and castrate, but we still have those pellets in there. And then we randomize, and now we have a castrate only, castrate with a testosterone pellet, enzalutamide, castrate and testosterone pellet, the BU-170, castrate with the testosterone pellet, and then the syntocamide, LPY-36, castrate and testosterone pellet. Next, please. And then same thing. Measure tumor volume and harvest the tumors and look at differences in gene expression. Next. So this is our control part. This just show, shows you and can hopefully convinces you that the compounds that we have are working. So these are LINCAP under castrate conditions. The control part, um, just vehicle, is in the black. So you can see the growth of the tumor at 20 days. It's about two. 2.5 fold larger than it was at the beginning of the experiment. The N-terminal domain inhibitors in the purple and green are showing an inhibitory effect. And then enzalutamide at 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight 
which is very effective. Um, the PK is at the bottom of the slide here showing that it has a plasma concentration at 24 hours of 30 micromolar, which is um, a very effective concentration. It's extremely effective. It's a great inhibitor. Next, please. And so now on the right side here, we see what happens with testosterone. So the control arm is the castrate plus the testosterone pellet in black. And you can see just how fast these tumors are growing now. After 16 days, they're now 4.5 fold larger than they were at the beginning. So they're growing very quickly. The castrate with just no testosterone pellet is in red. So you can see where just castrate is. And then the internal domain inhibitors are equivalent to just castration. And as I mentioned, these, these tumors don't have the splice variant. So this I think is as good as we can get in terms of hitting AR mechanisms. And then now enzalutamide, it's having a little bit of effect, but it, it wasn't statistically significant. So it's not really efficacious under these conditions. Um, which is similar to what the clinical trial showed for earlier antiandrogens like bicalutamide. Next, please. So we've harvested the tumors, and this was the most surprising data that we weren't expecting. So uh, the top right-hand corner is just to remind you that enzalutamide wasn't very efficacious. But when we analyzed the tumors, what we found is that in spite of not working well on proliferation or the growth of the tumors, it was still working very well at blocking androgen receptor transcriptional activity. So that's what we're showing here. This is PSA or KLK3 transcript levels in the harvested tumors. The dots are each of the tumors that we harvested. So you can see castrate in red and then testosterone in black shows the induction of transcript with androgens. And remarkably, enzalutamide is still inhibiting that, and so are our N-terminal domain inhibitors. Next, please. FKBP5 is a well-known androgen receptor in a regulated gene induced by testosterone, as you can see in black compared to the red. Enzo works great. Um, we do see a difference with this particular gene and how it's inhibited by our N-terminal domain inhibitors, uh, and that's consistently seen here, uh, where the LPY compound works very well, but the backup compound not as well. Next, please. So now we're looking at the androgen repressed genes. And so this is NOV. And so in red, you see castrate. And then when you add, add testosterone with the animals of testosterone pellet, you can see that this amount of transcript is turned off. And enzalutamide derepresses. So again, it's like, yes, enzalutamide is still impacting the transcriptional activity of androgen receptor in spite of not impacting tumor growth. And the internal domain inhibitors have differential effects on derepression. Next, please. And same for LRRN1. Testosterone just flattens the amount of expression compared to in the absence of of testosterone and enzalutamide derepresses that. And the N-terminal domain inhibitors have differential effects. Next, please. So now we're looking at in vitro experiments in LINCAP cells. Uh, the, the smaller um, illustration of the RNA-seq data is showing uh, the five different treatments there, just DMSO and then enzalutamide with androgen, DMSO and androgen and then the two, um, two epi compounds. And then we expanded the, the um, androgen repressed. So in the larger part, you can see the androgen repressed um, transcript levels. And what I really wanted to emphasize here is just the differential effects on the androgen repressed genes that we're seeing with these inhibitors. Next, please. Uh, next again. <laughs> Yes, there. So you can see here that for some of these androgen repressed um, transcripts, that enzalutamide works really well at derepressing in certain conditions, and the N terminal domain inhibitors don't. And in other situations, we're seeing that the N terminal domain inhibitors work very well, and enzalutamide doesn't. So this is where we see, next please, this is where we're seeing the largest differences between ligand binding domain inhibitors and the N-terminal domain inhibitors is on the androgen repressed genes. And we believe that this is because 
Many of the mechanisms involved in repression involve different domains of androgen receptor. Many of them involve the ligand binding domain or DNA binding domain. So it makes complete sense that we wouldn't expect to see the same genes derepressed because of the different domains of the receptor that are involved. Next, please. So conclusions, enzalutamide, really poor efficacy in the presence of androgens in vivo, despite remarkably the fact that it still affects the transcriptional activity of androgen receptor, both turning on genes and turning off genes. Next, please. The N-terminal domain inhibitors do maintain efficacy in the presence of androgens as predicted. Next, please. And most differences that we see in gene expression between the ligand binding domain inhibitors, such as enzalutamide and N-terminal domain inhibitors, reside in the subset of androgen repressed genes that become derepressed with the inhibitor. Next, please. So I had to show this data because <laughs> this is the very first uh, in vivo experiment that we did with the N-terminal domain inhibitors. And so these are subcutaneous LINCAP xenografts. We directly injected into the tumors the epi drug. This was in 2007. And my technician was showing me the data in the graph on their right as, as the experiment was progressing. And I was pretty excited. Um, you can see in the dotted line that the tumors are really regressing enormously. Uh, but then when she harvested the tumors and we really looked at them and she couldn't find some of the tumors either, there was this remarkable regression of tumor by directly injecting. And so <laughs> this was the data that I naively ran across the street to our clinic and showed our, our radiation oncologist, all excited thinking we should just directly inject the prostates of these patients. Um, and it was a naive comment and I'm slightly embarrassed about it now. But the idea still hasn't left my mind about please. And next again. Yeah, so the idea is, could we ever use these N-terminal domain inhibitors uh, in patients with early disease as an alternative to castration? With the idea being that maybe there won't be as many adverse side effects. So far, clinically, we find that these epi compounds are really well tolerated in patients. So far, so so good. Um, but this was the idea. And like I said, it's a bit of an experiment, uh, this talk. Um, anyway, next slide. And these are the people that that uh, have been working with me, uh, many for uh, over, over two decades. So um, thank you very much.